hi everyone in the audience and everybody watching at home. Uh, we're, we're here to, to run a quick panel on some data analytics, crypto analysts in the, uh, in the Bitcoin and blockchain space. So I'll be your, your moderator today, Harry Sudok, um, Harry underscore Sudok on Twitter, if you're looking. Um, I'm the director of strategy at, at Grid Infrastructure, a Bitcoin mining company, and we, uh, we, we heavily use data analysis in the way that we deploy our machines. Um, with us today, we have Rhea from Circle, we've got Tom from Delphi, and we've got Steven from The Block at the end. Um, so if you guys don't mind, would you kind of go down the line Give us a little a little overview of what you what you work on and uh, a project that you are either researching or writing about currently. Hi everyone, my name is Ria. Um, I am the lead analyst at Circle Research. I joined in May of 2018. Um, I recently published a report on Mimblewimble, um, Grid and Grand and Beam, um, and continuing to do some research on that. Hey everyone, Tom Shaughnessy. I previously founded 51% and merged it with the Delphi Digital team. We're five analysts. I'm one of the co-founders and we focus on institutional crypto research. Uh, we, the most recent thing I wrote about was generalized mining and that was last week. Hey, uh, Steven Zhang, head of research at The Block. So we're, uh, it's always very hard to describe what we are. So we're like, we're a media company, but we also do like news research we do like these infographics. If you guys seen the mapping, we call it like the mapping out series. We have mapped, we recently pushed out a open finance where we map out different sectors of open finance. Yeah, and uh, what I'm currently working on, I'm actually working on a deep project profile of Cosmos, which got, which launched last night, I believe. Very cool. Um, all, all of those are, are super relevant for the, the developments that are going on broadly and, and I've enjoyed much of your work. Um, so, a as analysts, um, we have a lot of options when we are looking for topics to, to create content around, and a lot of times the value in that content is created through the data that we're able to draw upon. Um, so I know, you know that it's, it's an ongoing problem, but, but data aggregation and uh, data cleanliness has been something I've faced. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, in, in the most recent project, you, you just discussed, or in others, you know, how you went about finding a data source and using a data source to arrive at some of the insights and conclusions. Sure, I can start off. Um, my most data-driven report is probably my 2018 crypto retrospective, which is an annual report on the crypto space, um, and it's going to come out on a quarterly basis going forward. Um, so for that, I focused on market data, on-chain data, and funding data to drive some of the insights in the report. Um, some of the challenges that you know you come across with data in the space is that the metrics that we traditionally use to analyze uh, traditional financial assets um, are, are somewhat misleading in the crypto space. So in order to paint a really complete picture of what's going on, you have to pull um, you know, a bunch of different types of data and provide caveats around it in order to in order to paint like an accurate picture of what's going on. So, for example, um, Coin Metrics has talked about this a little bit, but something like transaction count on Bitcoin is not fully accurate because it might not account for um, batched transactions. So, you know, in my research, I try to provide that caveat and provide additional metrics so that people really understand what's going on under the hood. Uh, so I think every report we do, we have to find different sources of data. So that's probably one of the hardest things that we have to do is find the data that corresponds with the token that we're actually researching. So we can't just go on Bloomberg Terminal. Yeah, um, sorry, it's in the crowd here. So you know, soon we'll have that we can use. But every token report that we do, we have to find a new source. And as a research analyst, you want to find multiple sources that you can use to actually correlate the data. That's extremely hard to do in crypto because even if you're lucky enough to find two different sources, um, most of the time they won't have comparable measures. So one of the good examples I give is I did a report on Decred and a lot of the analysis on Decred goes back to hybrid proof of work, proof of stake. A lot of that goes into tracking ticket prices, amount of tickets outstanding, number of votes, stuff like that. Uh, there's only really one source to do that on, it's DCR stats, unless you're gonna run a full node, which is extremely hard and time consuming. 
Um, so I think a lot of our job comes down to finding the best sources and making sure they're comparable so that we could then build out a report on it. Uh, it's a lot harder than people think, um, and that's how I kind of go about each project. Right. So um, I agree to that point. Um, though, the, like the interesting part about the crypto industry is that it seems like a lot of people in the industry really likes to contribute these like open source like tools and resources to people, right? So like. I've noticed that while doing my research, we noticed that it's, it was really hard to find these tools. And like, if you need resources on how many, how many ETH has been locked up in Uniswap, you don't know where to go, right? So like, we've been, we, we've been slowly con collecting a list of resources and tools that we've published on our site. So people can visit our site and visit, like, if they're interested in finding Decred, we have like a few resources that are linked to Decred. But to that point, like most, most projects can run their own phone nodes. So we, re we often have to rely on stuff like coin metrics. We have to rely that, we have to hope that their, their data is accurate or we have to find multiple sources, which is often not available. We can't, some, sometimes you really just have to rely on one source and you have, to, you have to base your report entirely on that source unless you can run your own node. Yeah, I, I have seen many of these problems as well. The, the thing that came up there twice was the, the concept of running a full node. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how full nodes play into the research that you're doing? You know, how do you treat an on-chain metric differently than an, an off-chain metric? What's an example of some off-chain metrics um, that you've leaned on versus the on-chain ones as well? Um, for off-chain metrics, so kind of going back to the market data um, point of view, I you know look at things like market cap, but obviously that is um, can be misleading because there's questions around uh, how do you measure token supply. Um, there are there is some work being done by companies like Masari and Coinmetrics um, around token supply and using proxies for things like market cap, like realized cap, where you account for things like lost coins um, in order to you know measure the value of a specific network and account for some of the the you know challenges with data that are going on there. Um, some other off-chain metrics around market data, you can look at like correlations between different crypto assets. You can look at uh, short interest on different crypto assets on uh, websites like TradingView to get um, kind of an idea of how the market is thinking about a specific asset. Um, yeah, so those are some of the off-chain metrics I look at. Yeah, so just, I guess, the only things I would say different from what Ray said is I guess I look at on-chain versus off-chain a lot when it comes down to governance. It's actually really hard to quantify off-chain metrics like community sentiment uh, beyond multiple hops of different personalities. So um, like if Vitalik supports something on Ethereum, there's no way for me to know how many people either like Vitalik or how many people actually like the change that he's proposing. Um, I think it's a little bit easier with, with other chains. So Tezos, Decred, et cetera, you can really gauge who's voting on what and why and who submitted proposals. It's very easy to quantify people's beliefs and positions. Um, I mean, there's obviously difference, differences between voting off-chain and voting on-chain. There's a lot of issues that come with on-chain, like autonomous software and issues there, um, and just fake voting. But I think it really comes down to gauging sentiment in the community, whether it's on-chain or off-chain. That, that's really tough in the space. Right, so for on-chain, I, I mean, I, I usually just go straight to metrics it has been a really reliable source so like I I work I, I see data as like hard hard data and like soft data so like in my view like soft data is stuff like sentiment stuff like communication or like when, like soft data so like for example I a lot of the reports I've done are like just deep dives into projects and then we need to, I usually in, intro that those projects with like a history. So like when did the founders find this company? When did they launch whatever feature they launched? And so, so soft data on that point is I often visit bitcointalk.org and go through the entire history of their form, go to each page, figure out the exact dates of their launch, go to their blog, visit, visit like read, read every page of their blog and like that's the soft Data, which I consider off-chain data. There could be different different definitions, but like I, I relate off-chain data usually sometimes to soft data. And another thing that comes to mind when you think about off-chain data and sentiment um, 
is like what are developers focusing on? And actually, Stephen published a really comprehensive list uh, of data sources on the blog, and one of the sources on there is Crypto Miso, and on there you can actually track um, like GitHub, like what's what developers are doing on different GitHub channels of different projects to see like how developer sentiment is changing over time. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a good moment to jump in on on you know not every not every participant in a community is contributing equally, so you know it, it matters a lot more if there's a developer who's saying, you know, I have a serious concern about this change, whereas, you know, I'm out there, you know, shitposting and saying, you know, it's not real money. Uh, but uh, but how, how do you guys handle, you know, you know, I heard community sentiment come up and I heard developer activity come up. You know, these are these are open source projects, but they, you know, there, there is an aggregation problem. Um, how are you handling giving your readers a clear sense of the development velocity and the community velocity of the projects you're covering? So that's, it's definitely a tough one. I mean, if you want to look at quantitative metrics, you could look at the number of GitHub lines added or removed from a project. You could obviously game those numbers pretty easily. I could hold space bar on my computer and add a million lines if I wanted to and then just delete it. But the point with that is now that we're getting real applications built on top of new public smart or smart contract platforms, we now have to add those developers to the initial, in my opinion. So when I think of Ethereum's development activity, I don't just think of the Ethereum core devs. I think of the Ethereum core devs, Dharma, MakerDAO, ZeroX. Then I have to think on top of that, all ZeroX is 20 relayers, what they're building out, who they're interacting with. So I think it's hard to say, you know, Ethereum added a million lines of code, they're better than EOS, which Dan Larimer doesn't even code it for anymore. But the point is, I think we have to look at the projects being built, the value they're driving or locking up, and then what that's actually bringing to consumers. Yeah, and to that point, you can also look at like how the infrastructure around a specific project is evolving. Um, like, what are the for-profit businesses that are being built around some of these projects? Like, um, for example, with Bitcoin, you know, you have a lot of applications that. Um, like for for, for profit ap applications like Lolly, which allows you to earn Bitcoin, um, just buying stuff on retailers and Casa and stuff like that, um, that are being built around uh, these ecosystems. Yeah, and in, in in the traditional M and A world, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna go out and buy a business, um, there's a measurement called criticality. So how critical is this business? You know, let's say let's say I'm going out and I'm I'm buying a CRM software. What's the switching cost for someone else to go use a different CRM? How, cr how critical is this business that I'm buying to all of its users? So I think that there is this, this um, opportunity in crypto to be able to define a criticality metric, which, which can be, you know, Ethereum is critical to, you know, to MakerDAO. How, how much? How much activity, you know, can I, can I apportion to the Ethereum chain? How much to the Maker chain? Do I add them together or are they multiplicative? You know, if, if um, Metcalf's law says that everything is geometric, you know, is every incremental user going to compound? I, I think the criticality point is a good one, but I think that a lot of crypto native people define criticality to crypto. So MakerDAO is really important to crypto. It's absolutely not important at all to the real world. So we need to make sure that when we talk about this in our reports that we make sure that we define what's important to crypto and what's important to the real world. The example I give with DeFi is DeFi is completely crypto native right now. There's no point for people in the real world to use it. Uh, but there will be a point if we're able to tokenize real estate and securities and I'm able to use that collateral to back a MakerDAO loan. That's the links and the bridges that we have to make sure we describe because we have to remember that we don't have to convince the people in crypto about this stuff. We need to convince the millions of developers that aren't involved and the billions of people that aren't involved in crypto to get involved. Right. So. Uh, agree to that. Uh, agree with that point. I think, uh, like every metric in crypto, can um, any metric that you use to measure like the success of a project can be gamed, right? But I think security is one of the few that you can't game. So, like, how how many hash rates or how how much energy has mine have miners contributed to your base blockchain? So, like, right now we know that. Bitcoin is the most secure blockchain because we could literally see how many hash rates being contributed to Bitcoin. We know Ethereum is the safest blockchain to build your D app on compared to, 
I don't know, EOS or Tron because you've seen the resources placed into that base chain. So yeah, so I've, 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 I've basically given up on trying to measure like the six, like developer activity because again, it can be gamed. You could, you, you, somebody, someone posted like a screenshot of, of Tron contribute, like contributed sources to, sources to like Tron's like code source, like main code source, right? Like you can see like someone just like literally like edited a few lines and they, that's considered a commitment to commit to Tron's GitHub. So like any of those can be gamed. You can't game value dedicated to a base chain. I guess I want to come back to the security point, um, ha and we're in my wheelhouse now. What uh, what do you guys do when handling, describing the security model for the for the chains that you write reports on? You know how how does security factor into your research, to the communications that you write? You know, what's up with security? Um, yeah, I mean, security, when you're thinking about security, you first have to dive into what the consensus mechanism is. So that's probably, you know, the first thing that you have to analyze uh, for your readers and explain how you add security to the system. Um, and then based on that, you, you know, after that, you kind of go into how much power and value is being devoted to that ecosystem and how that compares to some of the competition um, that that chain or project has. That's kind of how I think about it. Yeah, so uh, two of my partners, Anil Lula and Jan Lieberman, wrote an extensive Ethereum report. They led it. It was shared all over Twitter. It's like 65 pages. And, and one of the points that they bring up is when we think about security is we also have to think about the yields. So Ethereum switching to proof of stake. Um, everybody thinks half a percent is great inflation rate. We think it's not that great. But the point is that inflation rate or issuance rate is a yield of, say, 10% if you only have a few miners and validators. We don't think that that's good on a security or decentralization aspect. So we need to make sure we interplay security with decentralization and think about it that way because if the yields aren't sufficient enough, we're not going to be able to attract the nodes and the miners, or not the miners, but validators, to actually secure the chain. So that's something that we have to think about when we think about security. Yeah, so most of the projects that I've done reports on, they will, they haven't like launched, right? So actually, I guess, I guess like they've launched, but they haven't, they haven't really been tested. Like the, so the last project I've published a report on is Urbit, and they're doing like a, they're trying to build like a personal server so, so everyone can have like a personal, it's very, it's very, very weird. They, they have, they use, they use terms like galaxies and stars and moons. So like those, like, so those projects, like I try to, you can't really like measure the security yet, right? Because you, they just launched. You can, no one, you, no one has really contributed resources to securing the project. So, for most projects, I try to explain the consensus mechanism behind each project, and and then try to list the pros and cons of each project. I'm gonna I'm gonna totally jump gears and and get back to because c consensus mechanism is is really clear to the four of us um, and maybe many of you here and watching at home. But how do you handle education levels in your reports? You know what do you what do you assume the amount of information the reader has? And and you know you talked about the next incremental Bitcoin or blockchain user, you know, reaching that person for the first time and saying a lot of words they don't know probably isn't effective. So so what? What level of comprehension do you assume going in? I assume that my readers have a basic level of comprehension. Um, I try and simplify it in a way that they can understand. But um, assuming that someone is a little bit newer and wants to learn about a specific report that I'm writing about, um, I try and provide links to other resources uh, within the explanation so that if they don't understand a specific word or um, the math behind a specific concept or a mechanism, then I link to other sources that they can go to to dig a little bit deeper into that. Uh, so, I mean, we vary our report complexity depending on which product we have. Our biweekly thought pieces, we keep kind of high level. You know, we describe the industry. Our 50-page token reports assumes that people are very educated on crypto and know what's going on. But just stepping back, I mean, if, if the team itself has an issue understanding a project, there's like a 100% guarantee that the report's just going to fall flat. We need to make sure that if we don't understand a project, that we get educated on it and we could explain it in, you know, under 30 seconds. Um, I generally will turn my back on a founder if they can't explain their project in 100 words or less. 
I mean, it's just five. Yeah, same, same with the block. So we have a wide range of projects, and the complexity uh, it really depends on like our maps. The target audience is someone who have just entered the space and like heard of like open finance or decentralized finance and, and are wondering what that means. Our, our maps are essentially like an infographic describing the projects in the space and giving one line definitions direct links to the project's website explaining what that is. So like those are like super high level targeted at people who are just entering the space. And then our, our more data intensive or like deep project profiles, those we assume the reader understands the, understands the majority of the terms used in the industry. If there are terms specific to the project, we will try to, try to simplify it with like diagrams. So for Urbit, again, back to Urbit, I, I really love the project because I just did it. Um, when they ex when they explain like the galaxies and stars and moons, I actually try to draw up a diagram explaining that this is a galaxy. These are the stars that are circling around the galaxy, and these are the moons that are circling around the stars that are circling around the galaxies. And try to, and I think diagrams like that helps people understand it a lot better. I think another thing that's great about the crypto space and like about being research analysts in the crypto space is that we're public figures and pretty easy to reach. So if anyone has any questions about the reports that we're writing, then they can obviously directly reach out to us and ask us questions. This is a good segue. Oh, we have a question in the audience. No, no, no. What do you have? So to, to repeat the question back, um, the question is, it sounds like... Yeah, so, so the, the question for the stream is, is who are the users uh, slash readers of these reports? Do they vary, and what are they using them for? Uh, great question. I mean, the users vary a lot. I mean, our retail product goes to crypto retail investors, casual, you know, people that are hobbyists, people that want to get more involved in the space. That goes all the way up to, say, our weekly report that we do that's more for traders, Bitcoin investors, stuff like that. Um, and then our token reports are very much meant for deep analytical crypto type funds that, that want to understand token dynamics on the, at the best level we could provide. Uh, but I think that one of the things that we're thinking about is that we need to make sure that we could also educate, say, every financial advisor and every sales guy from traditional finance because there's going to come a time when all of their clients are interested in Bitcoin or Ethereum, probably not Ripple, and they need to know what to do uh, for their clients. Uh, so we're also trying to to drive some education that way. Yeah, so we're like, we're a mix, right? So we're, so we're not a pure research firm. So we have a news side where our star reporter, Frank Shapiro, uh, get Frankie scoops. Um, so yeah, so he, like his audience are like traditional, usually traditional finance or traders in the industry who are just like, they, they want to get access to that breaking news from Frank, he's usually the guy who breaks the news of this industry. Most people follow him because they know they, they want access to that news. On the research side, we try to, I guess, I guess like the one line pitches, we are trying to help you outsource your potential analyst hire. Why hire an analyst when you, and like hire them and try to get them to read a 60 page white paper and pay them $100,000 a year where you could subscribe to the Blocks Genesis product and read a 10 minute summary of this really complex project? I think for us it's pretty similar to um, the user base that Tom outlined, but also because Circle has Circle Trade, which is an OTC trading desk, and Poloniex, um, one of the key motivations behind launching Circle Research was to create a value added product for those end users. So one more thing, I mean, one of the things that I love about Circle and what they do is, and what basically RIA does, because you run the whole research bar, Maria, is they put out, or RIA puts out really good educational pieces on market structures and the players within those markets. Uh, one of my favorite ones is the DEX report, uh, covered all the centralized exchanges and the players there, and it's good from an educational standpoint. Um, and it's good for the other players in the, in the realm, because if RIA is able to educate them, then, you know, we could help add some analysis on top, and it's a, it's a helpful layering there. 
So I think I think that you know that that's where we're that's where we're we're looking from an end user perspective. I think that the conversation very quickly goes from the reports that they're putting out to crypto Twitter right afterwards. So you know I'm curious about what what are the conversations like after the report is put out? How are you handling you know criticism and pushback? You know if you if you write something critical, the founder of the project you just wrote about is responding to you on Twitter. So, you know, so I guess, and baked into that is, is as well, you know, how do you, uh, how do you handle primary sources versus maybe like a secondary data source? You know, are you, are you getting access to the people who are building these things, you know, from, from the ground up? And then where does that conversation go when it's back on Twitter? Um, so regarding the feedback and criticism, it, I'm pr pretty appreciative of any feedback that I can get, um, and I think that the community is pretty open, and so far, um, the the way that feedback has been communicated to me has been very constructive, so um, I, I'm honestly pretty appreciative. Like, when I um, published the Mimble Wimble report, um, I got really great feedback from the Grin and Beam team that allowed me to better understand um, the ecosystem. So it's pretty constructive. People are pretty open to communicating with you. And um, if they if they see you writing about their project, then you know they're also appreciative. So it's a pretty good two-way communication. Yeah, I think the feedback is generally constructive. Um, there's no way that you could cover every aspect of a crypto project in a report. If you do, it's probably going to be a million pages. No one's going to read it, or they're going to miss the point that they're asking you about. Um, on negative feedback, um, if we're, you know, I release negative reports on Definity, Ripple, a few others. Uh, Definity is a good example. Uh, one of their goals is to basically move all public cloud data onto your phone, your PC. Um, there's not really any good storage numbers on what the public cloud holds versus what's dormant on your phones and PCs globally. So I kind of backed into the numbers over shipments and storage amounts, stuff like that. Um, and it was negative. I mean, it was multiples different on what you could actually move from the public cloud to your devices. It just wouldn't work. Um, I reached out to the Definity team on that. Uh, they didn't respond to anything. So negative, generally the negative quantitative aspects are things teams generally won't respond to because it's not in their best interest to. Um, that's just what I found. Yeah, so we always try to reach out to the team first when we're, trying to, when we're doing a report or a story on them. I personally think any, any, any piece that brings conversation on Twitter or whatever form you, you guys want to use, it's good. Even if it's like negative feedback, I think it starts conversation around. Pe people, get, people start thinking like, when we recently released uh, gets more like an op-ed on like whether Binance coins BNB has value or like are, is CZ tricking his investors into thinking that because you burn BNB you're technically getting value. So like, I mean, it, it, we got a lot of, I mean, CZ blocked Arjun who, who one of our, like the, the writer of that report because he didn't really, he, I mean, I guess he, he wasn't open to negative feedback, but like you, you could see like the entire conversation shifted to like people wondering why BNB has value. People started like doing formulas and calculations on, hey, look, BNB has value because this is how we calculate it. Other people will argue and like it's, it's like incites debate, which is good. I think, I think any topics that, that creates debate on a forum is, is a good topic. Awesome. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I want to take a moment to kind of check with the audience to see, are you guys, what are you guys thinking about? Do you have any questions for these panelists? Can we answer anything? So, so just to repeat the question for the stream, uh, the, the paraphrase version is, how much rabbit hole is too much rabbit hole? And how do you structure your research process to make sure that you're getting a, a broad enough cover level of coverage, but you're not going too deep where you lose your mind? Um, I think one aspect that plays in really well here is you have to be viciously targeted on what you're doing and what you're researching. 
So I'll literally focus solely on 0x for six hours and turn my phone off and make sure I'm not on Twitter or answering any emails. Um, occasionally I'll come back up for air and realize that the academic paper I'm 74 pages into isn't worth it and I should back up again. But you have to really brush off at a very fast manner things that aren't relevant to what you're working on because there's just too much information and a lot of it's not value add. For me, I usually start off by creating an outline of whatever I want to write about and then try and tackle it section by section. If I find myself too deep into something where I feel like pulling my hair out, you know, it's important to take a step back and talk to someone about it. Um, I think like both internally and externally, there are a lot of great resources and sometimes you just need someone to explain it to you in order to um, like get yourself back down to earth. Yeah. Uh, same on my side. Um, I usually work with a template, so it's always good to have a template so you know that you shouldn't move. You shouldn't move way out of that template. Like, so if, if, you're, if you're working on the history of a project, you should focus on the history of the project, project where the founders met, when did they launch, and then if you're working on why the project matters, you should focus on why that project matters. If you're working on the tech, there at some point you're gonna dive too deep into the tech, and then you, you, I will personally. As that, like, bring it back into my Slack channel, and we ask, like, is do we even do we think the reader cares that X this does this and uses consensus mechanism this, which connects to this blockchain over there? Like, if we don't think that's important for the for the reader to understand, we won't dive deep into that area. Awesome. So I heard I heard manage your time and distractions very 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 explicitly, and talk to other human beings when it feels like it's getting too crazy. Um, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead at the front. 95% uh, of marketing is entire speculation, and most of these projects are probably never going to build anything. Um, looking at Ethereum, it's progress right now, and all these wonderful things that they've done. We last year did this year, they're still comparable. Uh, VC-backed startups are still coming out, and you know, their progress is still significant. So my question is, when you write these research reports as if they're real companies doing real things, versus just saying, hey, look, it's a financial So to, to parrot the question back, it's coming from a healthily skeptical point of view around the, the financial instruments attached to the projects. Um, you know, assuming, assuming that a significant piece of the involvement in the market is speculative, um, what, is the, what is the purpose uh, for, the, for the research given that, given that the, the financial activity is maybe not as closely related to the development efforts of what the project in and of itself is supposed to accomplish? Great question. Uh, we ask, I ask itself, myself that probably every time I write a report, but I guess at a high level, our thought is that crypto is here to stay and it's going to mature into an industry that actually requires legitimate and extensive analysis, just like what you find on Wall Street for normal equities. The other thing is um, we're indifferent to the fact that these tokens are not equities. We're well aware. We, we don't care, to be honest. Um, our point is to describe and analyze the different levers we can pull that or not pull or will be pulled that can make a project successful or not successful. Um, our readers are interested in how MakerDAO's change stability fee will affect the price of Maker, if anything, or if not. Um, they're interested in how the growth of DAI could actually be scalable or not scalable. Um, so we have to come at it with the aspect that readers are interested in token investments, which is very different from the VC world, if not unraveled from the VC world. Um, and we don't need venture capital firms to invest in growth equity tokens um, or utility tokens or security tokens. So it's definitely a completely different market, but I think my view and Delphi's view is that the market's here to stay and grow and it's gonna need legit research. Right, um, I mean, 
Like, I think you're being too generous for saying 95% of the, of the space is speculation, right? Like I think 100% of the space is speculation. But even, even, to that, even to that end, like you don't have to be an investor to want to learn about a project, right? Um, so like you don't have to have, like it, let's compare it to a, a equity world. You don't have to have investments in Apple to want to learn to read a, a biography about Steve Jobs. You don't, you don't have to have investments in Amazon to read the everything store. Like people, I think the, the, the good thing about this space is like people want to learn. People want to learn about these complex projects. People want to learn about governance systems and like see, so like I mean, the, the, the thing that attracted me to this industry is like you can literally see economies forming from like a literal like infant stage and you can see slowly the, eco the economy of Bitcoin evolving, civil wars happening. Like you, it's like literally history and economy growing and it's like at a rapid pace. You don't have to wait a hundred years to see civil wars between different communities, people following people who believe they're Bitcoin Jesus. It's like, it's, it's so fascinating. I think people want to learn. People want to get educated about the space. People want to learn about the people, the players in the space. Yeah, just to piggyback off of Tom and Steven, um, I think the assumption that we use when approaching research or when thinking about research is that people are interested and they want to learn more. And when you look at the crypto space, there's still no standard way of, you know, learning about a specific project. There is no, like, they're not required to consistently um, inform the market about what they're doing. And resources are really fragmented. So the value that we add is aggregating all those resources and painting a really complete picture of what's going on with s different projects or with the industry as a whole. Yeah, I, I'm going to jump in on this one, too, because um, I think it's really interesting is, is that, you know, if you look at and let's go back to equities again, you know, if you look at the, the you know, market cap weighted, you know, top 10 companies in the S&P 500, none of them existed in 1995. They just didn't exist. And they all use the Internet and they're all the most valuable things on the face of the earth, allegedly these days. Um, and so, you know, we've we've we live in a world where things are demonstrated that a sea change can happen in an instant and it matters to pay attention. Um, so, you know, these are the folks doing the work paying attention. Um, and I, th I think that, you know, we're, we're dealing with something that has a big enough lever to really, really matter at the global scale. Um, and so, you know, it, I'd, I'd, I'd always rather take the crack at learning about it than not. Um, even if the vast majority is speculation or is vaporware, um, the stuff that isn't is worth it. The other thing to think about is, back to Ria's point on information sources, I mean, there's absolutely no information on a private VC-backed company that I could ever get access to, right? I can go and make your tools right now and have complete information of the whole system at any second of the day. So the information flow is more and different, but it's completely different from the, the VC world in the past. And even if, uh, just to quickly end this thought, uh, even if a lot of these projects don't exist like five, ten years from now, just through reading the research that we're writing, you learn so much about the technology, um, monetary policy, economics, governance, that's definitely going to help you learn about the projects that do exist in five, ten years from now. So the question is, uh, can we each reference an aha moment in the midst of our research, whether it's about the market or about a project uh, specifically? Um, sure. So I guess that's a, it's a tough question because you got to zoom out, I guess, after you're done researching. So it's probably known to a lot of people in this room, but Polkadot is a competitor to Ethereum. I didn't know that when I started researching. I thought this was just an interoperability platform and we're going to build bridges and everything's great. Um, after about two days of four Red Bulls, I was like, wow, Substrate and Polkadot is a direct competitor and is a platform to Ethereum. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Bring all the competition we can. I think there should be more and less handholding, but that was a, a big aha one for me. Um, for me, when I started writing about Grin, Beam, Mimblewimble, and just thinking about you know privacy coins, um, I didn't really com completely comprehend the need for privacy or think about privacy as a right, but as you dig a little bit deeper into the ethos behind some of these projects, you know, you realize that this is just a basic right that we should have as human beings. And a lot of people don't realize that. And I think they will start to realize that 
as more things like Cambridge and stuff like that continues to happen. Right, um, my, ha my aha moment came less from my research and more of like, so originally our majority of our team were either Bitcoin maximalists or pure no coiners and like we never had like this guy who was like super bullish on ETH and then when we hired Mateo, who's our like ETH bo, like he gave, like he was my aha moment was like, wow, Ethereum might be building something cool. Like, Decentralized, fi decentralized finance is ac it's a pretty cool product to be to like release onto the world. So that like that's my aha moment. I think it's like it broke my bubble, basically. My my aha moment um, is that scarcity is provable. So you know, like I I like the the gold example. So in theory, we can go you know mine more gold on an asteroid, more gold than we have on the whole planet. And so I think that these assets are so interesting is that the, the, the physics works. So, so this scarcity that we're, that we're dealing with is, is actually real. Um, and there's no black swan that can tell me, you know, there's more of it. Um, at least not in a way where I wouldn't know it. Yeah, so the, the question is um, where, where do traditional financial institutions fall on the spectrum of, I don't know anything about this except I've heard the word Bitcoin before, all the way to being ready to purchase research from the folks up here? Uh, it's a great question. So I did equity research for two years, cloud and communications. Uh, I fell down the rabbit hole while I was at that job, wrote a huge white paper on blockchain and Bitcoin and, and Ethereum mostly and uh, left. But to your question, I think we have to back up from trying to fit a need within traditional finance and realize that a lot of this stuff is extremely disruptive to traditional finance. When I go on meetings with banks, whether it's large banks, small banks, they're all interested in banking blockchain and crypto or in the research, but they don't know how to sell the research, or they're interested in using blockchain to streamline their own processes when they're using Microsoft Word, you know, 2001 or something. So, you know, a lot of the areas don't make sense from a traditional finance perspective. I think a lot of it makes sense from an educational perspective because there's going to be a light switch event and a lot of traditional banks are going to be caught off guard from larger players that are just going to destroy them in five years, whether that be Circle or Galaxy or, or take your pick. So the question was about the data specifically um, with regard to on-chain data, market data, a blend of the two. Talk about that. I think in order to paint a full picture, you have to look at all types of data um, because there are issues with looking at only one set of data. And because we have like public blockchains that you know give you access to everything that's going on under the hood, it's important to look at on-chain data, definitely. I think it depends what aspect you're researching in, in respect to which project. Um, off-chain data, or off-chain data, but off-chain sentiment and soft data is really valuable when you're trying to judge um, developer uptake of a project, developer interest. You know, am I going to build on Tezos or am I going to build on Ethereum? That's extremely important to me. I want to know why. I want to know, you know, what are the benefits of using Mitchelson and OCaml over coding on Solidity? Um, talking to five developers goes a long way. Uh, seeing the the apps built on Ethereum versus the apps on Tezos is a big deal too. But going the next mile and realizing, okay, OCaml might limit the amount of developers I get, but you can get some really smart people to build enterprise-wide applications on this. And that could obviously have a zillion users. So I think you have to really go multiple levels when dealing with off-chain data versus on-chain data because it's all subjective. 
right? It really depends on like what what are what you're trying to do, right? So if you're trying to if you're trying if you're trying to figure out who the hell is paying two hundred fifty thousand dollars for virtual land on Decentraland, I'm gonna do a few API calls to, to figure out what address is doing that. If you're trying to just figure out what a specific project does, I I would do let you you do less on chain data. You, it's it's more more of like that soft data move where you go interview the founders, interview people who have maybe invested in the project, go through their forms, go through their in, like history communications, go go on their Twitter account, try to figure out why they built their project. So, so the question is, will will the the age-old McAfee bet of self-consumption come to pass? So, so embedded in that is um, is what are the price predictions? Uh, I'm always nervous to give these, um, you know. So, so do you, do you have a time frame? You think? Twenty twenty. Okay, okay. So o over under half a million by twenty twenty with a with an opportunity to give something more specific if you'd like. I mean, I think it's irrelevant. I think it was just a marketing ploy to get followers, and he got a zillion out of it, and good for him. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I think price predictions is just shooting yourself in the foot at this point. As you said, it's all purely speculation. So, I mean, long-term bullish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I believe the price is below the trend line. I think there's, like, a data source that tracks that trend line of whether he eats his, you know what. Um, uh 2020, yeah, um, price predictions are, you know what, forget it, $100 million by the end of 22. <laughs> yeah, so like, it doesn't really matter, right? Long, super long-term bullish on Bitcoin. Yeah, the, the way that I typically answer that, and I'll jump in here, is, um, is I think that we're more likely to see higher highs than we are likely to see lower lows. Question is, uh, how is the market going to grow, and what are the catalysts? I like the rapid fire. I mean, one thing that a lot of us are looking forward to is seeing a lot of um, institutional grade providers coming online, hopefully later this year. So, you know, as they come online, it's obviously not going to happen at, at once because institutions still need to figure out how they want to get involved in the space. But I think that'll definitely help grow the market. Great question. Um, I think as custody comes online and real use cases or real interest from institutions, then you're going to get the whole research aspect that they're going to need it. Fidelity just came online to offer you know, solutions for digital services. I don't know what that means. I think it's probably custody. But if they're able to custody you know, 1% of their $2.5 trillion in assets or $2.5 billion in assets, whatever the number is, um, that's going to be a lot of interest and research and what they need for there. So, so I think the the way you grow this market is to make people realize they need the product, right? So the way Bitcoin becomes a pure, like the dominant store of value is because you need people to believe that it's a dominant store of value. And how do you make people believe that? Um, I don't know. Maybe China decides that they won't, they're going to go after every single billionaire in the country and peop and then these billionaires realize that you can't transfer the, what, what happens when your bank accounts froze and what happens when you, what happens when you try to move like 50 tons of gold through the airport you, you know you can't do that so like there needs to be that trigger that makes people realize that this is something valuable that this is so, like I could literally carry a mil 100 million dollars in my head through a brain wallet and travel across different borders I think the other thing is, it's widely known, but there are a lot of UX challenges with the industry. Uh, you know, it's very developer heavy and they're not really focused on UX and design. So as more companies come online that are focused on making it easier for users to onboard, um, you know, I think that'll be another thing that helps grow the market. Yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that it's gonna be inflation. I think inflation is the biggest is the biggest bull indicator, um, and 
And you know, if you look at the, the amount of EU negative interest rate debt that's been issued so far, if you look at the appetite for the right and the left, both in America, to grow the deficit over time, um, I, think that, I think that the global appetite for debt and the resulting inflationary pressure that we're going to be faced with is, is probably the, the most bullish macro trend. One other point there. On the flip side of this, because we sell research, we don't have to be bullish. Um, we could make a market out of just calling out every project that's illegitimate. Um, it's a race to the bottom, which we wouldn't want, but that's also a market for us as well. Next question. So the question is, what is the viewpoint on ICOs? Uh, oh, IEOs. Um, do you mean that from a regulatory perspective or from a excitement or? Okay. So feelings on IEOs, initial exchange offerings. It's the first time I've heard of that. I've never heard of yeah. them before. Is, is, it, is it like Binance's launch pad? Well, I mean, I mean, it seems like they're, they're doing a good job with their Binance launchpad. Everyone thinks Binance's launchpad is going to be the next trigger to, for the, the bull run, right? Because it seems like every single project that gets listed on Binance's launchpad gets like this in, in, tremendous amount of interest. Like, yeah, like Justin Sun bought BitTorrent for like, what, $100 million, $100 million? And then he sold the token on through launchpad and he got like, I don't know, $600 million? I'm throwing out numbers here. But like he got, he got a good return on his investment. Uh, thank you for the quick definition. That was helpful. Uh, an, an ICO on an exchange, I, I don't think that solves anything. Um, that just makes it easier for consumers to buy a potentially terrible token. Um, I don't think consumers have an issue creating liquidity for bad projects today. There's a million out there. Um, so I, I don't think that helps the ICO market or crypto at all, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll still come up against the same regulatory challenges that ICOs are facing, so. Yes, uh, two unrelated questions. Uh, the first one is just kind of interested in the process for how you guys decide what you want to write about and where you're going to pick a topic. Are there any, like, indicators in the community that you're picking up on? And then my second question, uh, crypto Twitter is a rather small place, and there's a lot of Two-part question. First question was, uh, how does the topic selection process go? Second question is, back to crypto Twitter. What are the what are the most um, what are the most uh, misinformed. misinformed memes? Unsubstantiated, popular memes. Uh, me and the five guys have a cage match, and you know the last man standing gets to decide. No, uh, it's really hard to pick a topic to cover. Um, you not only have to pick a topic that's relevant, you have to pick a topic that's either extremely misunderstood, uh, coupled with that's actionable, coupled with that has enough liquidity for people to invest in, coupled with you actually have enough information to cover it, it has to be live. There's a lot of check boxes that have to be checked, and even then, you never have all of them. A uh, good example is uh, Grin and Beam. Uh, Rhea covered it recently. I wrote a report on them a few months ago. Um, they were extremely hard to cover because it's two teams that are, one's open source, one's a company, but other than that, both weren't launched. So it's really hard to pin down, uh, even a, you could cover the reports to the T, but they're all a white paper until they're launched at the end of the day. Um, on memes, uh, you know, ETH is immutable, that's one. Um, Anthony's laughing in the crowd. Um, you know, um, the other one would be uh, Ethereum full node is four terabytes. That's an annoying one that we see a lot. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I said. Uh, for me, I usually keep a running list of things that I'm interested in based on conversations on social channels like Twitter and Telegram. Um, there are some really high quality Telegram groups. And then other things that are important um, in my topic selection process are like what are VCs and hedge funds thinking about and investing in that really helps, you know, narrow down what you want to look at, and then also feedback from um, people internally and externally. Um, yeah, topics usually work, they're almost like a consensus. 
uh, at the block, right? Someone pitches an idea. Hey, we want to do this. Anyone thinks, what do we think about it? And if, like the majority of us say, no, this is not something we should focus on. We'll, we'll go to the next idea until we, until we realize, like, okay, everyone agrees to this topic. We'll do this topic. On memes, um, I guess I want to, I'll play it safe. I think HODL is a very dangerous meme because they're, the belief, I mean, I think people believe that HODL means like you will never sell, but my view is HODL means that you hold until you reach that point where you think you should sell at. So like if, that, if the goal for you, if your HODL goal is to buy a house with your Bitcoin holdings, you should sell at that point. It doesn't like it, it. doesn't mean like once you reach that goal, you should continue hollowing because you think it's, you can buy two houses, right? Um, I don't write research for a living, um, so I'm not going to jump in on my selection process. But on the meme side, so the meme that I think is the least substantiated um, is that Bitcoin is bad for the environment. Why would it be bad for the environment, or not bad? The argument is that mining is very bad for the environment. As someone who works in mining day in and day out, that is utterly not true. The, the, from a hydroelectric standpoint, from a energy source standpoint, from an overflow standpoint, we talk about it afterwards, but that is not true. In the back. So the question's continuing on mining. Um, how do we how do we look at non SHA two fifty six mining, um, maybe POW and POS? Um, but gotcha. So so non SHA two fifty six POW mining, um, and second, is there an interest level from the institutional folks, specifically around mining and understanding it slash maybe investing in it? It's a great question. Um, to be honest, it's not something we've really covered yet. Um, it's definitely a great topic to look into. Uh, I think there's a lot, lot more interest now on getting away from mining and on proof of stake. How much does it cost to be a validator on Tezos or Ethereum or Decred on staking, even though that has mining as well? Uh, what are the costs? What are the yields? Do the economics for Serenity actually make sense? Is there break-evens? Uh, we have a lot of issues with Ethereum 2.0 just for this reason on what a validator could earn on a yield ratio. Uh, so we've definitely focused more on the proof of stake side than the proof of work side, but it's a good topic. On institutional questions, um, we haven't seen that many, to be honest, beyond a traditional bank being interested in, say, NVIDIA or Bitmain's IPO. Uh, but from a data center perspective or an infra infrastructure perspective, uh, it, it could play in. But, you know, I speak with Harry before. I used to cover or co-cover the, the fiber providers, Zao and Equinix, et cetera, the data centers in my last job. And there's not a demand for bandwidth, lit or, lit or dark fiber. It's very throughput, less intensive. So it really comes down to electricity, OPEX, and CAPEX costs at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I can say, you know, we, we have fundraised and we continue to fundraise for grid infrastructure through traditional, um, through tr the traditional capital sources. So institutional folks are willing to lend against our businesses. They're willing to invest in equity in our businesses. Um, so we, you know, we've, we've seen demonstrated interest from that standpoint um, in SHA-256. Um, from a GPU mining standpoint, uh, I mean, I think, I think that you really need to look at the market, and this is going a little bit in the weeds, but just looking at the work that's going on at NiceHash, um, understanding kind of what, the, what a 51% attack looks like if you're going to lease the GPU power to do it, you know, understanding, you know, how, how actually decentralized are some of these projects. A lot of it is just kind of rental, rental hash power. Um, so being able to do some of the work around splitting out, you know, where that hash is actually coming from is a really interesting um, project. So I know there is work being done around address clustering on some of these other chains. Um, there's a project out of Europe called GraphSense that is doing that does really interesting address clustering work and they're working on kind of understanding what is the ecosystem of addresses look like some of those being pools um, I know there's a big spec mining community that's out there that 
you know, some of it is is for hire, some of it's for personal speculation. Um, and I've I've seen VC interest in GPU access as a way for them to scale into a position. Um, so there, you know, there are a lot of different ways that you can kind of play the GPU game, but um, you know, but security is a concern, decentralization is a concern, uh, or at least a question. Also, I think a lot of time is being spent on the algorithms to for miners to basically trend or automatically switch from mining whichever chain is most profitable. I think there's a lot of interest going on there more so than iterating on the hardware itself. Any other questions? I know we've kept you here a while. So thanks to these thanks to all of you coming here. Thank you to the video crew um, from Ara. No, circle the video. Circle the video. Circle. 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 <laughs> she, she, she brought, she brought the video stream to all of you at home. Um, thanks to everybody uh, who's here, and, and thanks so much to our panelists. Thank you, guys.